Well, congratulations. You have now listened to 19 talks. If your heads are not spinning, they should be spinning. I thought I would take my 10 minutes to try to move towards some integration of those talks and look at the question, what, whether should we, should we do this or not? Whether we should do it, why we might want to do it, why we might not want to do it. Is the extinction a good idea? The title of my talk in the program is de extinction, hubris, or hope? And the answer, of course, is yes. <laughs> a little bit of both. The other answer is it depends. I want to talk first about some of the potential costs or risks of de extinction. Secondly, some of the potential benefits of de extinction. And then third, I'll give you at least my current take on how I weigh the balance. I think there are five potential costs or risks of de-extinction we need to be concerned about. There are issues of animal welfare, of health, of the environment, of politics, and of, for want of a better term, morality. The animal welfare issues, I think, are fairly straightforward. We are making animals that didn't exist before. If we cause them intense and unjustified suffering, that is not an ethical thing to do. And sadly, you heard both from Alberto and from Robert that two of the earliest cloned, uh, in one case extinct, and in another case endangered animals, died quickly. Cloning is not always a safe technology. We need to pay attention to whether the animals that are brought back are animals that are going to be suffering. Second issue, health. We need to worry a little bit about whether the animals that are being brought back will have a negative impact on human health or the health of other animals. So for example, maybe the passenger pigeon would turn out to be a wonderful vector for some nasty disease. We don't know. We can't exclude that possibility. We do know that sometimes diseases spread not because the pathogen suddenly appears, but because a great vector for it suddenly appears. That's, I think, the reason we've had the spread of West Nile virus in the United States. A mosquito that was particularly good at transmitting West Nile virus spread through the United States. So there are some potential health risks there to us and to other creatures. Third issue, the environment. In a sense, bringing back the passenger pigeon or the mammoth or the dodo wouldn't be putting an alien species into an environment. It used to be there. On the other hand, the environment it used to be in doesn't exist anymore. I grew up in Ohio. Ohio today doesn't look that much like Ohio in 1800. The environment has changed in both gross ways and subtle ways. No one wants to be responsible for introducing an avian version of kudzu. Or, to stick with the avian, to stick with birds, another starling brought to America by some idiot who wanted all of the birds mentioned in Shakespeare's plays to be present in the Americas, thus giving us hundreds of millions of loud, nasty, annoying starlings. So environmental risks. It's really an alien species in today's environment, even though it may have been appropriate at one point. Fourth issue, political concerns. You've heard a lot about what I think is genuinely the biggest political concern. If the biggest selling point for preservation of endangered species as extinction is forever, taking that away could have some political costs. Costs that many people would regret, not just the conservation biologists, but most of the people interested in de-extinction. That's a cost that we'd have to take into consideration. There's another more subtle potential political cost, I think, and that bounces back not on the conservation biologists and on endangered species, but on geneticists who might worry about someone saying, we've given you guys hundreds of billions of dollars for 20 years to cure cancer, to cure AIDS, to cure Alzheimer's. You haven't done that, and you've given us a pigeon? <laughs> the potential pushback of frivolous, uh, you, some of you may remember the Golden Fleece Awards that Senator Proxmire used to give to what he thought was silly sounding research. That's a legitimate political concern. The last concern is when I have a harder time getting my hands around. It's sort of a moral concern. I say moral for one of anything else, but it's the idea that this is not something man should do. These things are extinct for a reason. God wanted them extinct. He just happened to use a bunch of American hunters with shotguns to drive the passenger <laughs> pigeon extinct, but that's what he wanted. Or 
in a particularly annoying Darwinian secular version of it, Darwin wanted them extinct. Those things couldn't stand up to natural selection when natural selection involved a bunch of hunters with shotguns. It's a strange reaction, and yet there is a visceral sense that many people will have that this is unnatural, this isn't what was intended, this is wrong. We should let the past stay the past. And that is going to be an ethical concern for some, and of course, ethical concerns also translate ultimately into political concerns. But what about the advantages? I think there are five potential benefits as well. Those advantages are scientific knowledge, technological progress, environment, justice, and wonder. Scientific knowledge. How much could we learn if we had even a not complete mammoth genome creature roaming around? How much more would we know about mammoths and how they functioned? How much more, as Beth said, would we know about how specific genes functioned? How much might we understand about evolution and the processes of translating genome sequence into actual animal function? Those kinds of things are very fascinating. It's frustrating now when all you can look at are the bones of these creatures, and occasionally, if you're lucky, some old, usually not very scientifically rigorous depictions of what their behavior was like, it wouldn't be perfect, but how much better would our scientific knowledge of these be if we actually had animals that were quite similar, if not perfectly identical to them? Second issue, technological progress. This is at least, and I'm gonna stick with the George Church approach at this point, this is a form of genome editing, of genetic engineering, there's a lot of interest in genetic engineering for lots of reasons, but it could be that the de-extinction pushes that technology a little farther and a little faster in different and more useful ways than it's currently being pushed. And we might end up with technological spin-offs that would be much more significant than the Teflon and Tang that we got from the moonshot. Third benefit, environment. You've already heard something about this. Bringing back extinct species may make the environment better. Locally extinct wolves in Yellowstone have changed the environment in ways people think would be better. Stanley talked about how the dodo, the missing of the, the loss of the dodo, may be affecting trees in Mauritius. Bringing the dodo back might make that environment better. There's another more subtle point, though. As uh, Carl Zimmer said, starting off, what if we bring these back and we don't have any place to put them? Well, maybe bringing back greater numbers of the Red River soft-shelled turtle would increase the political and economic interests in cleaning up Lake Tai and the other locations where its habitat has been destroyed, leading it to the brink of, distinction, of extinction. Perhaps having the de-extincted animal can then be a pressure point to push for conservation and environmental cleanup. The fourth advantage is another one of these complicated ones, hard to get my hands around, and that's justice. This one has a lot of visceral appeal to some people, including to me, though I'm not quite sure what I think of it. Take the passenger pigeon. Climate change, habitat change, a bunch of things may have contributed, but you know, I think what the main force leading to its extinction was, was a bunch of Americans and Canadians with shotguns and rifles, and railroads to ship the corpses to market. We killed them. If we killed them, and now we have the ability to bring them back. Do we have a duty to bring them back? Do, they, do we owe it to them? Now this is tricky. Those birds are gone. We're not bringing them back. You and I didn't shoot them. Some of our ancestors did. There's similar issues with things like reparations for slavery. The slaves can't get the reparations at this point. It's only their descendants. The slave owners can't pay the reparations at this point. It's only their descendants. Should we do it or not? There's this deeper problem when you're dealing with non-humans. We know about owing rights to humans, owing duties to humans. What kind of duties to justice do we owe to non-humans? And if we do owe them, how far does it go? All extinct species, how hard do we have to work? How much do we have to spend? The last advantage, I think, is the most powerful, and that is a sense of wonder. It would be awe-inspiring to look at a woolly mammoth, walking around, or a saber-toothed cat, or a giant ground sloth, it would be cool. It would be like that first time I turned the corner and saw Yosemite Valley spread out before me. 
And that is a real advantage. It's hard to put dollars and cents on that advantage, but it is a serious advantage. Most of what we do in our lives, we do because we hope for something that will be cool, at least awe-inspiring at best. So that's what I think are the pluses and the minuses. How do they balance? Well, I can tell you how I balance them. I don't think we should ban de-extinction, even if we could, which we might not be able to at this point. I do think it's probably not something that the federal government should spend a lot of money on, except in a, perhaps a few very potentially uh, uh, beneficial cases. There are other higher concerns. But if private people want to spend money on this, I think that's fine, as long as they do it in a prudent way. It's crucial here that de-extinction advocates appear prudent and cautious. It's even more important that they actually are prudent and cautious. And so things like concerns about animal welfare, concerns about the environmental consequences, concerns about which species go first, I think make a difference. As Jim pointed out, we don't have a legal regulatory regime for this at this point that comes anywhere close to dealing with these issues. We need to think about either legal or non-legal ways to try to do de-extinction in a way that maximizes its benefits and minimizes its risks. But I'm just one voice. I'm not going to make this decision. You're going to make this decision. What we really need is to start the education process so more people know what the potentials are, the pluses and minuses are, so we can turn this, one hopes, into more hope and less hubris. Thank you.